pitch timer. It yeah. took years. Here it is. It looks great. What do you see? What I've said for years is baseball is supposed to have a pleasing leisurely pace. It's not supposed to have a plodding lethargic pace. Okay. So I've been in favor of this for a number of years. Uh, and I think it's working out great so far. From a broadcasting standpoint, which is less important, but some people have said, is it difficult? I've only called one game so far under these circumstances, but basically this is the pace that I was used to in the 80s and 90s it's faster, when I was though, calling games. Does it feel fa faster? Faster yeah. in this respect. It's uniform. Everybody has to pitch and get into the box at the mm -hmm. same pace, whereas previously you had differences. So if one guy was more deliberate, that's when you tell a story. Or one guy mm -hmm. tended to step out of the box, that's when you could make a point. Now a uniform pace has been imposed, but that's fine. Mm -hmm. People will adjust to it. I think by and large, it's a really good thing. Where are you on, since the umpire does have to get into it, right? This is yeah. excellent. I mentioned 37 minutes faster. Wow. Mm -hmm. You have to pay attention to the at-bats now. Right. Um, as Ump discretion as far as start the timer. Where are you on ump discretion and some leniency here and there? I think you need to have it. A good example would be you get a pop down either line that lands untouched in foul territory. But the corner infielder plus the second baseman or shortstop plus the left or right fielder, as the case may be, converge on the ball. They all have to get back to their positions. And if there's a base runner who thought it might be fair, that guy might have rounded second base and has to come back. Right. There has to be some discretion there. Where were we on Pete Alonso when he got dinged, when that was a strike? I, I, I thought that should have been a warning kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, just be advised, this is what we're trying to do. He was really lollygagging, though. And if you think you're trying to buy time for your batter and give him an advantage, yeah. I understand saying, wait, that's egregious. Do you know it, what I mean? Yeah. Isn't that a line from Bull Durham? You know what you guys are? Lollygag. You're lollygaggers. Oh, exactly. You're a bunch of that's lollygaggers. Robert Wool, that's yeah. our guy. You know, what you don't want, uh, you don't want something, and I understand why they were doing this. They're calling it to the letter of the law mm. in spring training to get everybody used to it. So it doesn't really matter that that game involving the Red Sox ended on a pitch clock violation. The game ended right. with the tying that runs was in on spring base. Training. In spring right, training. Right, right. But you do not want that to happen in an important game. Imagine if that were to happen in a World Series game. That would make a ticky-tack holding call in the Super Bowl, right, a questionable right. bump on the right. last shot in March Madness, yeah. look like nothing. Right. Uh, but now, now where Machado is getting tossed out, I understand it. He called time at 8, not 9, but at 8. You mm -hmm. have to be alert to the pitcher at 8. And then you also cannot argue balls and strikes. So it seems ticky-tack, and yet... No, if you're going to let that go, you, that's the slippery slope. I'm okay with it in April to get everybody on right. the same page. But let's say you've got a situation like the Bryce Harper Suarez at bat last October. People bring that up, but then what are you going to do? Say, hey, this is such a good no. at bat. Why don't we spread it out? You're not going to call it as tight. You're going to have some discretion. I think you're either calling it or not calling it. You're going to have some discretion. The, the one thing I no. thought was discretion was uh, Shohei Otani makes the last out and he's pitching. Yeah. yeah, he's got to be out in two. He was actually out two minutes, four seconds. I think there is where he said, all right, give. Well, that's a, guy, that's a little go bit to the at bat. Right? A little bit like the catcher has to make the last out or he's on base. Got to right. put his equipment back on. But I think once you're in an at bat, even if it's Suarez versus Harper, you have no choice. It's like, no, the timer, start the timer, pitch. Yeah, in. In, in general. But do you want to call it to the millisecond when all that drama no, and tension no, is at no, stake? No. You know, I said to Tom Verducci uh, back when they first instituted the rule during the offseason, you wouldn't want that rule to get in the way of Kirk Gibson against Dennis Eckersley. Mm. And then Tom actually put a stopwatch on the at-bat. Yeah, how fast was it? Yeah, no violation. Yeah, no, of course. Tying, tying, run, <laughs> right. on tying right. run on base. Tying run on base in the bottom of the ninth in the World Series, World Series. And Eckersley always delivered within 20 seconds from when the pitch timer would have started. Right. The reason why the at-bat seems so tense and so much drama is because the count went to three and two and there were many foul balls. Right, right. And under these rules, you're allowed one timeout. And Gibson famously did call timeout with the uh, count at three and two because right. he remembered the scouting report from Mel Didier that said, as soon as I'm sitting, as sure as I'm sitting here, Padna, if the count goes three and two, you look for that backdoor slider, which is what he hit into the pavilion. Right. That's amazing. So, yeah, the pitching was happening at a much crisper pace back then. Yeah. Uh, you know the next frontier, automatic strike zone. Where are you on that? More of the human element going out of the game, not just from the umpire standpoint, but that little nuance of pitch framing, that's an important thing. Oh, that, well, that'll no one be, cared that'll... about pitch framing until like seven years ago. Like this, suddenly we got to protect yeah, the but, pitch framing. You know, but that's because we were able to calculate pitch framing. Yeah. Don't, don't you think that back in the day, Whitey Ford thought that Elston Howard or Yogi Berra was framing pitches for them effectively? They, they, they probably were. Yeah, they were. Well, they well, definitely ask, were. But, but now, if he, Bob, if we can get it right, like this is the thing, like I put in a new rule. Mm -hmm. It's great. We thought it would be great. Here it is. This will be great 
if it's getting right. Now, if they say it's making seven to ten errors a game, that's too many. If it's getting one, well, that's a lot fewer than an umpire will get. What about this middle ground? What if you were to say you have the robo ump at the ready, but the plate umpire is not just a messenger boy uh, for for what the robo <laughs> You're making it so bad, has, right? Has the robo cop, the robo, the robo. You're an errand boy. The robo yeah. ump has, tell, has told him, but it's at the ready, and you have a certain number of challenges. Three minimally, maybe five but would then, be the most. But then the a certain number of challenges that you use at oh. appropriate times. But but the auto zone is you're having it there and you can challenge is what you're saying. Yeah. All right. A certain amount of challenge is fine. If you think, hey, wait, that missed it. Let's review. Oh. Right. But you're reviewing it on what? You got to review it on what's what we're seeing in the box, right? So you're yeah, using or the electronic strike zone. Right. Right. Whether whether it's the box you see on television or whether it's something more sophisticated and more precise. Right. That's back in the command center, the same Be as they use to review two, plays two, at two, on two the three bases. challenges a game. Yeah. No, what, no, whatever it might. Good. We, whatever it might we be. That. Here's here's another one that yeah. could be kicked around, and I'm not saying I endorse it, but it's worth thinking about. Umpiring at home plate is different than on the bases or on the foul lines mm -hmm. in the postseason. Some guys are demonstrably better than others. You can rank this. Why? Yeah. yeah why yeah. Why not have guys who are only Plate umpires. Specialists. Yeah, yeah they don't they don't it. work every day because you can't work the plate every day. It's too arduous. You pay them more. Yeah, actually. you pay them more. Them. <laughs> or whatever it is, yeah, or they, yeah, or they only good. work every fourth day or whatever it might be. Right. And then you're assured of fewer mistakes. Right. You know, those guys are good. You can rate them on this. They have rankings. You can right. do it on there. One last thing. The Mets have the number one payroll. I really wonder mm -hmm. what you thought about this. And by a wide margin. Yes. Um, is this good for, I hate that, is this good for baseball, but is a runaway spender good for baseball? Well, it's been good for baseball in the short term because it sparks a lot of conversation. Um, and spending. Look, oh, Yankees, Padres jumping up. Do Dodgers have now been bypassed. For yeah, so, it, so it's good It's good for the players because as a group, you know, high tide raises all boats. Uh, as they used to say, all politics is local and all sports is local too. If the Pittsburgh Pirates somehow had this wherewithal, their fans would be good with it if their owner could spend like Steve Cohen is spending. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, you're from the heartland. You're from KMO, KMOX. Right. Um, my point was the Cardinals have historically been within $100 million of number one. Yes. What if now they're more like 150 to 200? What mm -hmm. if, uh, if this keeps going and the Cardinals are doing it the right way and spending money. Great yet, farm system. Right, but they're doing it, and they're spending, but they're not cheap. And yet, I don't want the Cardinals to be $300 million no. away from number one. Wouldn't that not be good for baseball? It would not be good, although the divisions help. The central division in both leagues But now you've changed the schedule, helps. so actually it's a more balanced schedule. So actually you're not just playing your, you know, your local teams. That's true, but the standings in the division are still the same. You've still got to beat the mm -hmm. Brewers rather than the yeah. Mets or the Yankees or the Dodgers, and the Guardians still have to beat the Twins or, mm -hmm. or the White Sox as opposed to the powerhouse right, right. teams. One, one thing is a general thing. Uh, we've talked about it before. We've each written books about it that touch upon it in one way or another. A league, and I've always been on the player's side. I was on Marvin Miller's side way back mm -hmm. when and Kurt Flood's side. Free agency and the increased riches of players in, a, in the big picture sense is a very good thing. But a league is a fundamentally different thing than other businesses. It's an enterprise in which the competitors must simultaneously be partners. Right. CBS can't tell NBC how many broadcasters they can have, mm. but Steve Cohen still can't have a 27th player. He can't go to 30 players even though he could afford right. it. So you have to have some mechanisms in place that, if not imposing equity or complete competitive balance, at least keep it from running away. Right. That's that, that's You have to have right. that. Otherwise, you don't have a league. Right. You have to have it fairly close. And I, I just think now, like, I've never seen it so far away. They've always had the penalties enough where that big spender has to come back. Yeah. I wonder if that, do you think, does Steve Cohen eventually said, I can't pay $100 million in taxes? Does he come back or does he just well, keep spending? Well, supposedly his net worth is $17 billion. Mm -hmm. But let's suppose that Jeff Bezos whose net worth makes, uh, you know, Steve Cohen look like pocket change, and he's uh, expressed interest in buying the Washington Commanders, let's suppose he wants to buy a baseball team. Mm -hmm. He doesn't care at all. Right. He, <laughs> he makes Steve Cohen look like he's pinching pennies. What was that thing from Citizens Kane, right? They said you lost a million dollars saying to Randolph Hearst. And he said, right. well, in that case, like another 150 years, I'll be, I'll be broke. Right. But it's not, it's not much as compared to what he has. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Rosebud, kids. Rosebud. <laughs> you can look it up. Thank you, Bob. <laughs>